Young sir was telling me, uh, my journey as a, as a student, as a clinician, as an academician started from this city. So Guwahati is always very, very special to me. It was my first uh, PG conference, and uh, uh, let's not talk how many years back, but a long time back, last century, when I, it was my, my first year PG, and we flew down to here. And uh, the good joke was none of my PG batchmates wanted to go back to Chennai. We all wanted to settle down here, thanks to the natural beauty of both the birds and the beautiful ladies and the nature around here. So it was a good, uh, good time we had those days, and one of the best conferences which was ever organized in my specialty was by Dr. Boyan sir. And uh, he was my, my first paper presentation in my life as a PG student, and he was the judge sitting there. And, uh, and I'm getting the honor of having you chair my session again, sir. It's an absolute uh, privilege to be here. Thank you for your blessings and thank you for all the love uh, and, uh, and uh, the camaraderie that I get from this part of the world. So I would like to make this uh, presentation of something which I've not done uh, elsewhere. It's uh, combined from many aspects. One of the aspects is people keep asking about how to do pain-free endodontics. So this presentation is more to do with how to handle, manage, or if not prevent pain when we do in clinical endodontics. So it would come from a combination of a lot of things. Uh, I'm, a, I'm an academician, I write textbooks, I am an editor of a journal. I have my private uh, clinical practice, uh, which is what I really love. I'm an exclusive endodontist. I use a microscope-based practice in Chennai for the last 15 years. So. So, okay. So, for the last 15 to 20 years, uh, my journey has been something of being both a clinician as well as being an academician. So, what it does to me is when I give a lecture, what you would get out of this lecture in this next 45 minutes is I would try to amalgamate two things. Uh, I've seen many speakers who will talk academic stuff, which is right, but it should be clinically relevant. And uh, I see a lot of clinicians who come and talk who talk about what they do in their practice. It's nice what you do in your practice, but uh, sometimes when you're a clinician, you're like a, like a frog in a well. You only know what you're doing in your practice. You don't know what's happening around. So as a speaker, I always feel that uh, uh, it needs to be a combination of both. You need to be both a clinician, and you also be, need to be little knowing academic so you understand what you're doing has got some sense or not. So today's a post-prandial lecture. I have become famous for giving post-prandial and post-banquet lectures. They normally call me as the first speaker after that. Is there, most of you here, it's nice to come and talk in front of a non-endodontist. Uh, most of you, do you remember your first endodontic case in your life? Do you remember? Yes or no? At least I do my first endodontic case. And uh, in my part of the world, they would normally ask us to do it on an auspicious day. My boss would say it should be done on an auspicious day. And uh, just to give you a preview. Okay. That's it? Okay. Uh, the colors look a little different, but okay. Uh, I hope uh, there is some clarity in this. Okay, before I go back to my anecdote, let me go back to the lecture because let's not waste time. I titled this lecture as Seven Rules for Painless Precision in Endodontics, uh, mainly because I'm talking to a lot of practitioners here, clinicians, and I want to give you some, some clinical inputs which you can take back home so that you can practice in your endodontics and you try to make sure that endo is not only about saving tooth but the process by which we save the tooth. It should not be in a way that the patient finds it too uncomfortable. For me as a student, this image, have you seen this image? It's a nice cartoon which came in 1960, no, 1978 in the Life magazine in the United States. This is an image of a small boy who's writing a word called liar under a board which says painless dentist. That's the cartoon. And this cartoon has got relevance even today. Because if you go and ask people around the world, when you say what do you do and you say you are a root canal specialist or a dentist, 
the, the immediate reaction everybody has about you is they walk back, they step back. You and I don't have the most romantic profession on earth. When you go tell your non-dental friends that your dentist are especially a root canal specialist, the first reaction is pain. <laughs> Interestingly, two years back, the American Association did a survey. They, they wanted to find out what are the most awful experiences a man or woman can go through. So to the United States public, they asked, please tell us the 10 worst experiences in your life. 10 worst experiences. They said don't put marriage as one of them, but you can put all other experiences in life. But I'm not joking. The 10 worst experiences in life, top five experiences which came up, one of them was getting a root canal done by the common man, by the public. It's not a joke here. The top five worst experiences by a common public done in so-called the best healthcare system in the world in the United States, and they say getting a root canal done is a pain. So you and I talk about doing endo all the time, but the process by which the patient experiences is totally different. So this lecture is basically, it's not a lecture, it's about a few overview of what I can share with you in which you can probably do your root canals a little less painfully. I'm, I'm an author of many textbooks. I'm not going to talk from any textbooks here. I'm not going to talk from journals here. I'm trying to keep this very clinically relevant. What I'm going to talk is from this. This is my practice in Chennai. This is my room. I call this my Garden of Eden. I have a small garden in my practice. And I love to do my endodontic work. And that's the only thing I do all the day. I don't do general practice. I do a microscope-based uh, endo practice. And every day, the same question comes to me from every patient. Doc, is this going to be painful? Is this question asked to you by your patients? Yes or no? Every patient would say two things. They will say, I heard it's very painful. And you all will say, no, no, it's painful in other practices, but not in mine. We lie well. But uh, that's the first question they ask us, is it very painful? So in my experience over these two decades as a clinician, I'm trying to give you an overview of what to expect. So when I framed this lecture, I, saw, I thought of what are the seven things probably you should have in your mind uh, when it comes to talking about pain in endo. The first thing is, before I talk about pain and predictability of endo, I want you to understand when did endo actually start. This was a question I'm always curious. Right from a childhood, I'm a quizzer, okay? I like to go for quizzing and uh, who did it first, when he, you know, this, which year it happened, I always used to love quizzing. So I went and asked my teacher, Dr. Buyansa knows Dr. Parameshwaran was my teacher. I went and asked him, sir, do you know when the first root canal treatment was done? I wanted to know who did the first root canal treatment. Uh, my teacher looked at me and said, first you do your first root canal treatment well before you ask about who did it and where he did it. So this question stayed with me for a long time, who did the first root canal. Uh, if I show you this image, everybody knows this image. What's this? Man on Moon, 1969, Armstrong. But I wanted to know who did the first root canal. Finally, I got the answer, you know? I got the answer in recorded evidence. I'm going to show you something, who did the first root canal. This is an x-ray of the first done, probably recorded evidence of a root canal therapy being done. And you could uh, see that at the, at the bottom of this root is a periapical lesion. And this is obviously this x-ray, this x uh, on radiocarbon dating of the skull they found. This was in Egypt, in Sinai Peninsula, and they found the oldest evidence of somebody attempting a root canal therapy inside a tooth is 200 BC, 200 years before Christ. So what you and I do uh, by calling root canal therapy is not something new or something fancy which has come in the last 50 years. Mankind knew that when there is a periapical lesion, the only way to go through is through the root canals and try to disinfect it and then do it. If you ask me, uh, when I showed this slide to one of my students, one of my students said, sir, they had x-rays in Egypt in 200 BC, was the next question they asked. Um, I said, no, not really. This is a skull, uh, which they found now, and they have taken the x-ray. But the uh, point here is, whoever did this x-ray, or uh, did this uh, treatment, we know the outcome would not have been very predictable, looking at the work. It would have been painful, it would have not have great success rates. But when you and I do the root canals, what happens? So I want to tell you the seven points which I feel are important. Point one, which I feel is this. This is a lesson I learned the hard way. 
Uh, the first uh, clinical tip I can give you is treat the patient and not just the tooth. Uh, this has got nothing to do with endo. And that's the best lesson I learned in endo after I finished my master's. Uh, because we normally, when I was a student, I was treated, asked to treat a lower molar or a, and a premolar. So the tooth, the, the patient will become 3-6, 2-4, 1-3. You know, we'll only call the patient like that. Bring the 3-6 in and do the root canal and go. So I did my MDS. I did it very well. I came out, got a job in a very good center, and I was doing my work. I learned this lesson, and I'm trying to teach it to you. If you want to be a good clinician, you want to be a good practitioner, treat the patient and not the tooth. Why? I'll show you this. Two years after my MDS, after I finished my master's, I had a patient who I treated. I'm showing her x-rays now. This is the x-ray she came with on one of her teeth, which endo was done. Please, this is not done by me. Somebody has done this endo, and I'm, I'm seeing this case. The moment I look at this tooth, my mind is immediately saying, let's retreat this tooth. Let's, let me do retreatment in this case. But the patient simply says, I have no problem in this tooth. I've come for the other contralateral molar. I had to do on the other side. But my eye is looking, somebody has left a root, somebody has put some silver points, and something is done, and, and the patient is asymptomatic in this tooth. And I did endo in the other tooth. This is the endo I did in the other contralateral molar. <laughs> now, when you look at these two x-rays, can you tell me, uh, please uh, try to be rational and tell me which work is better, which, oops, which work is probably more uh, obviously goes by the book and does all the ticks, all the boxes, you would obviously say one on your right. But done by me, I was very happy with my work. This patient walks back after four days. This is a true life incidence. So, and she's the patient I'll never forget in my life because she brought me back to earth. Because I thought I've done a great job and after three days she comes back. Uh, I'm in a referral practice where I go as a consultant and a dentist. So I go to that practice again and see this lady sitting in the front reception. I go to talk to her. I have a thumb rule. When you do good work, mm -hmm. you like to talk to those patients. Have you observed that? When you do good work, you like to talk to your patients. When you don't do good work, you, don't, you want them to disappear. You know, get lost. <laughs> I don't want to see you again. But this is a case I've done good work. So I went to meet her. I saw and said, hi, madam, how are you? She's a very elderly, very polished looking lady. And then she tell, looks at me and tells me, you youngsters have to learn to do better work. I'm talking 15 years back, I was younger. So she had said, you youngsters have to learn to do better work. And I looked at her and said, what happened? She says, 10 years back, before I did, she did the other root canal. She said, when I did that root canal, I had no pain postoperative. After you did your root canal for two days, I had awful pain. I keep looking at her and then I say, okay, did you take medicine? Or how are you feeling now? She says, I'm feeling better now. But, and then did, she just dismissed me. She didn't want to talk more to me. At the end of that, when I walk back to my chamber and I look at these x-rays, here am I as an endodontist. I have done everything. I got lateral canal, C-shaped canal. I filled it. Look at the apical puff and all. But at the end of the day, I lost the patient. In the eyes of the patient, who was a better dentist? The other dentist. So please, I'm not recommending you to leave one root and put two silver points in the other root. No, that's not the point here. The point I'm trying to make is the most important lesson to have a successful clinical practice is your work has to be good, but more importantly, it has to be painless. If you do great work with pain, you're not going to be a successful clinician at all. So this was the thumb rule I picked up very early in my private practice. So from then on, my focus as a clinician, in my city, I'm known to be a very, very renowned endodontist as a clinician, but my focus always has been try to do the work good and try to do it painlessly. So from this, which happened to me, I will now tell you what are the things I look for when I do my endo work. As I told you, the first thing to remember is the anxiety of the patient. According to the public perception, 60 to 70 percent of the patients, all of them, you ask anyone, they don't want to come to you. You don't run a spa for people to walk in smiling. For them, the moment they think they have to go through a root canal, it's a scary experience. So anxiety is high. Added to that, our procedure is always done with the help of anesthesia. It's always done with LA. I don't know how many of you are brave when you want to get injected. 
Do you feel good getting injected? But we always look at our patients and tell them it's just an injection. Keep smiling, keep your eyes open, keep your mouth open, and I want to inject you. But actually, the patient's heart is in the mouth before you get into the pulp. So it's a very, very, very difficult scenario when you're going to handle patients especially. And that's why in endo we have a scenario called hot tooth. A hot tooth is what is a patient who's not cooperative to you with your doing your endo. So one of the common questions asked to me in, in courses is how do you handle a hot tooth? I'll always say if you handle the patient well, the hot tooth doesn't exist. Because if you're the patient is cooperative, they normally are able to go through that. So now I'll give you a few tips which I feel is most important when you want to handle patients when you're doing before you start your procedure. The first thing is to understand that nobody likes getting injected. More than 10% of patients in dentistry don't come for endo mainly because they don't want injections. So you need to understand that the injecting part is a tricky part. So you need to do a few things more. What we can do, I will tell you that a little later. So point to remember is endo pain is very painful. In the American Association of Pain, they grade the pain of acute pulpitis in the same league of myocardial infarction, acute colic pain, cluster migraines, and natural labor pain. It's the same level of pain with acute pulpitis. So when a patient goes through acute pulpitis, the kind of pain he or she goes through, if you ask any one of you who's gone through pulpitis, you realize it's unbelievably very painful condition. So when you and I do endo, the challenge is the condition is very painful, number one. It's more painful than any other procedure in dentistry, what the patient is undergoing. Second point, the public perception of the procedure is painful. Okay, I'm going through pain, but I, the, the public feels that the moment this guy is gonna to touch me, the pain is going to be more. So both these are against you, and added to this is you have to use an injection at the start of your process. You add all these three. The worst pain, perception is painful, and you're going to inject. You add all three, no wonder nobody likes us. That's the biggest challenge when you start an endo case. So if you want to be a good clinician, I feel you need to handle the patient well in this. So anxiety management is the most important. And for that, the, most, the best tip I can give you is to be empathetic. When you show little care, when you are not in a hurry to start the case, when you listen to the patient. One of the best advices I got from a teacher was, he used to tell me, listen to the story of the patient for two to three minutes, no matter how boring it is. But please listen because then he will give the next 30 minutes to you. And which I feel is the best advice I picked up from my, my teacher. Because I feel when you listen to them, the story is the same. Uh, I have pain, I can't eat, I, I can't sleep. You know, the pain, the, the, the story is always the same. But if you are able to just go through that and then show a little empathy, there's a huge difference between the words, sympathy and empathy. If you are empathetic, you can be a good endodontist. The second thing is, once you show that empathy, the patient feels they are in safe hands, the second important law in painless endodontics is to get the anesthesia right. Please get it right. Now the question comes is, how do I get it right? If you ask me, first point as I told you is to be empathetic, then is using a topical anesthetic. I don't know why many people feel it's frivolous to use a topical anesthetic. It's a fantastic placebo when you use a topical anesthetic. So I see some schools teach it, some schools don't, but I feel as a clinician, it's so important that you have some placebos with you with which the patient feels comfortable. Topical anesthetic is a must. And the other is loading of anesthetic solution. In India, we don't use cartridges much. This is for the international couple of delegates who are sitting here. We don't use cartridges in India much, so people use wires. So what is the trick we do? We try to load it in front of the patient to show that we are using a fresh needle. Your patient's anxiety levels is up by 30, 40% when you load needles in front of them. It's the strictest no-no to do ever. So don't load your anesthetic solution, <laughs> apply a topical. It's no point applying a topical. You have to tell the patient that you have applied a topical so that the, the placebo works. The mind tells them to relax, that it's not going to be as painful as it sounds to be. And when it comes to uh, endo, maxillary, there's never a problem. It's always the mandibular molars where we face the pain when we are handling endo. And 85% of endodontists, all of us, feel the toughest tooth to anesthetize is the lower molar. And that's why the lower first molar has the highest incidence of hot tooth incidences. So how do you handle this? How do you handle this? First, you to understand that how do you know whether your block is working or not? 
When you give your inferior alveolar nerve block, how do you define that it's working? And one of the common things I've seen all over is we ask the patient for some signs. What are the signs? We ask for any tingling sensation in the tongue and especially in the lip. We want them to say whether the lip is numb or not. So we ask whether the lip is numb. Now please listen to the statement very carefully. If the lip is not numb, it's a 100% indication that your block is not working, if the lip is not numb. So lip numbness is a fantastic way to find out when the block is not working. But if the lip is numb, it does not mean that the block is working. It's a paradox. So you'll have many cases where the lip will be numb, but the patient will still will be experiencing pain. So, so you have to remember that soft tissue anesthesia of lip is not an absolute indicator of a successful INB. So we don't have any test by which you know accurately whether your block is actually working or not. So for me, the thumb rule is if the patient is uncomfortable, I feel the block is not working. Simple. They, I don't, I don't uh, see, I tell them, no, no, the lip is numb and all. If the, lip, if the patient feels uncomfortable, I junk, I don't do the procedure that day. So what else can I do? What are the ways in which I can improve my inferior nerve block? Now, these are the two couple of things which I do in my routinely in my practice. Number one is this called, what is the speed at which you anesthetize? I've obviously seen that most of us want to do the process fast, so we like to inject fast. So this is a fantastic study is done by many groups, including Malamed, and what they found is if you give a slow block, which is for 60 seconds, 45 to 60 seconds for 1.8 ml, and a fast block is when you inject within 20 seconds. So between 20 seconds and 60 seconds, what happens is most of the clinicians inject between 20 to 25 seconds for 1.8 ml. And that is considered as a fast block. And it's a paradox. When you inject your LA fast, it actually works slow. It slows down by four to five minutes. Why? Because I don't want to go into pharmacology, but there are, are these sodium channels which get uh, sensitized and they close down faster. So it has to be injected slowly if you want to work, make your block work faster. And how fast does it work? It works. It's got, when you inject slowly, A, the patient is more comfortable. The pain of the anesthesia comes from the, the rate at which you inject and not by the needle or anything else. The number one parameter for pain during LA is the speed at which you inject. You get a deeper anesthetic efficacy and you also have pulpal anesthesia occurring at least two to three minutes faster than anything else. So if you want to, one of the best tips for me to go ahead to do better endo is to speak to the patient well and then inject, give a topical and inject very slowly. The other thing which I personally prefer in endodontics is I prefer articane over lignocaine. In India and most of the world, most dentists use lignocaine. But if you look at endodontists around the world, most of us like to use articane. Although studies will share both are equal, but personally speaking over years and from what I see from around the world, the depth of pulpal anesthesia is slightly better with articane. So we, most of us, I personally use articane for the last 15 years. I don't use lignocaine much. So we feel it's a much better anesthetic than lignocaine when it comes to doing, uh, uh, doing endodontics. Then comes the volume. How much do I inject? In maxilla, it really doesn't matter. For in mandible, we have clear evidence to show that in irreversible pulpitis cases, that's the case in which the patient comes to you with pre-op pain. When the patient comes to you with pre-op pain, the, sometimes the block doesn't work. So what do you need to give? You need to give the best trick is to give two blocks. Now, now is the why should we give two blocks? Now, the other mistake I've seen most clinicians make, most of us make, is when you give a block, we normally would like to start doing the case in how many minutes after the block? How much time do you wait? How much time should you wait after you're giving a block? If I have to extract a tooth, if I have to place an implant, if I have to do an endo, should I give the, I give the same block? Am I right or wrong? I don't give different blocks. I give the same block for all procedures. But when I want to extract the tooth or place an implant, I can actually do it much faster than the time when I take to do an endo. Why? Because the time the pulpal nerves get anesthetized is far different from the time the soft tissue, the bone, the alveolar mucosa, and all other pedantic ligament gets anesthetized. So you can wait for three to four minutes and pull out a tooth, but you can't do that with endo. 
One of the things which we never picked up from Malamed's study, I'm quoting uh, Professor Malamed a couple of times, because if you want to listen to him, he's going to come to India next year for the World Indo Congress. And one of the things which his research found was, when it comes to pulpal nerves, if you give a block in an acutely inflamed pulp, it takes, guess how many minutes to get a mandibular molar pulp anesthetized? It takes sometimes 16 to 18 minutes. How many minutes? 16 to 18 minutes. Now you tell me, would you like sitting in front of a patient for 16 to 18 minutes and chat with them and wait for LA to work? Normally we don't do that. We, we, we get impatient and we start working and that's why I personally feel most dentists have episodes of hot tooth on the chair because they start working too soon. So if one thing I, I do for many years is if I get a patient with preoperative pain, so the clinical tip for you to take back home, patient comes to you with a preoperative pain. How do you define preoperative pain? In the last 24 hours, if the patient said that, that they had an episode of pain, I would always give them two blocks. I don't even ask. I give them the first block and I wait for 15 to 20 minutes, I make them sit out, I start my next case, I'll do some other work, then bring them back to my room again for the next block. Or I will anesthetize them and I go to the other room and work on some other patient, but I will never start a case within the first 20 minutes if they have a history of preoperative uh, pain. And in my experience, I don't get too many hot tooth episodes in my center. I don't face that challenge mainly because I give LA some time. And that's the best tip I can give you, 20 minutes of waiting and giving a 3.6 ml, more than 1.8 ml in a hot tooth, is probably the best clinical advice and tip I have ever learned in my endo career. All other supplemental anesthetic blocks, intraosseous, periodontal ligament, VAND, all are very fancy and nice, but this is a simple and easy way by which you can get a predictable uh, uh, pain management, is what I do. The next question is, can I anticipate pain? How do I anticipate pain? Is there some patients who will give us more pain? Between men and women, who gives you more pain? The right answer is men, right? Men are a pain. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I got an answer, yes. <laughs> uh, in, in, in common life, men are a pain, I absolutely understand, because you know why? Because I have an answer for that. Uh, the, the, the chromosomes for the male and female Males, we, females we know is XX chromosome, whereas the male is XY chromosome. Even we don't know why we are like the way we are, so we don't know uh, why men are like this. But unfortunately, in endodontics, men are better than women as patients. Because we have strong evidence which so shows that postoperative pain is little more experienced in women. Females experience more postop pain. It's got to do something to do uh, to, to their monthly menstrual cycles. So certain periods of the month, they are more sensitive to pain. So post-op pain is more often seen in females. So one, what we have seen in endo. Post-op pain is more often seen in molars than in single rooted tooth. So when you do molars, you need to be aware that it will have a more chance of getting post-operative pain. It's a paradox. I used to think that if you have a periapical radiolucency, that's the case which will flare up. That's what I was taught. You know, the patient which will have more post-op pain. But it's the reverse. A tooth without a periapical lesion is a tooth to watch out because the periapex is absolutely uninflamed. So if you make a mistake and push something out, the patient has more post-operative pain. So absence of a periapical radiolucency is in a patient is a high risk for getting post-operative pain. So if a patient is female, patients are uh, uh, having a molar tooth and it is not having a lesion, these are all in high risk cases. And the next point is tooth is in occlusion. So if you have a molar in which the opposing molar is also present, again a case in which you have to anticipate postoperative pain. And the last point most important is history of preoperative pain. If the patient says they had preoperative pain in the last two days, the probability of them having postoperative pain is about 75%. So I will never tell my patients that after my procedure that you'll have no pain. That's a lie. So when I look at this, I tell them that there is an opposing tooth. It's a molar I'm treating. I don't say you're a male or female. I don't talk about that. But I'll always say you have a history of preoperative pain. So the chances of you getting post-op pain is high. You tell the truth to the patient. So the patient is mentally aware 
for the next 24 to 48 hours, I will experience pain. And that's most important when you are, a, uh, when you are trying to treat such cases. Now, enough of LA, let's go into clinical uh, endodontics. So for me, endo is about two points very important before I touch the patient, how you treat the patient and how you anesthetize the case. The next, case, next point to do painless endodontics is how do you find all the canals? Access is success. So as a specialist, we all use microscopes. Uh, this is what I use in all my cases. But if you don't have a microscope, you can at least start using a loop. I feel the field in which you definitely need 2.5 to 3.5x magnification is endodontics. Otherwise, it's impossible to see and do what you're doing. So as a clinician, if there's something I tell them to buy first in endo, is I'll say buy a loop. A good quality loop, 2.5 to 3.5x, will make a huge difference in the way you do your access preps. And then I'll tell you how you do your, I'm sorry, the images are a little blurred out, but it's clear in my slides, but okay. When you do your access opening, you need to be clear that you do it in a way that you can get straight line access for all your canals. If you do not get straight line access and you do these kind of mouse holes, you will not be doing a thorough job. The pain comes, intraoperative operative time pain comes because of your inability to trace canals and your ability to push debris out. These two things happen in a constrained axis. Look at this axis, and now I'm showing you the next slide. You need to get an axis like this. So when you get an axis like this, which follows the shape of the tooth, you've got a straight line axis into the canals, your ability to see and do all your cases is much more. And that's how you're able to get cases like this, in which you have a MB1, MB2, MB3. You're able to do cases and ability to trace them and work on them becomes much better. So when it comes to pain, to make sure that you find canals, your ability to do good access preps is so, so very important. Only when you see things like this, you'll realize that on this side, I can see my orifice clearly. Whereas here, I have a shoulder which is preventing my orifice. So unless you realize this, you will not be able to, what happens is you push your instruments in a, in a way that it pushes more debris inside. So a word which we use a lot in endo about straight line axis is so important that you don't push debris out. Because one of the most common reasons for post-operative pain is you pushing debris out. So how can I prevent that? I can do that by modifying my access preps. So if you look at this, the next image, the tooth which most people feel most easiest to do. If you ask me, I see in many schools around the world, they like to give premolars to undergraduates. And they'll say molars is for postgraduates. And if you ask me if the tooth I respect the most is a maxillary premolar. If there's a tooth you should be worried about having the highest incidence of post-operative pain is a maxillary premolar. So maxillary premolar never forgives. If you extrude, it pains badly, mainly because of its propensity to be so close to the maxillary sinus, changes of anything down there, the patient perceives much more. So you extrude in a maxillary premolar, you had it. The other thing which you face is in the maxillary premolar is the amount of debris in the isthmus. So if you look at this uh, string of images I'm showing you, all you'll realize one, two, three, four, between left to right, what you see is your ability to remove the shoulder so you're able to remove the pulp tissue which is present in the middle third is slowly removed and then you get a clean canal down there. You will leave pulp tissue behind. You are causing a potential pain incidence which will happen either in the short term or in the long term. So the next aspect to remember is that all canals, we were all trained that Everybody has three, molar means three canals, premolar means two canals, anterior is a single canal. But as we do more and more work, we realize that canal variations are more of a norm. So you never go into a tooth with a prefixed notion. In India, especially around the world, the tooth with the highest extra canal is the maxillary first molar, with the MB2 being the tooth with the highest amount of MB2 being the tooth with the highest amount of extra canals being the MB2, 60 to 75 percent. The lower molar has the second distal root in about 55 percent. So if you ask me the right definition of how many canals are there in a molar is no longer three, it should be four. Four should be the bare minimum. If you don't find the fourth canal, it's a good day for you. Otherwise, 50 to 60 percent is like alternate case, you should find extra canals. 
I'll show you a single case here because my topic is about pain. I'll just show you a couple of cases here, but I'm going to show you a case here wherein if you look at this case, the moment I see the pre-op x-ray, because I again show this case because the pre-op x-ray is a very good clue to find extra canals. When people ask me how do you find extra canals, I don't use a CBCT in every case. But in this case, I just have an IOPA. And when I open up the access, what I do next is I know this is a case with extra canals. If you look at this image, this is the mesial root, MB1, MB2, MB3 on one side. This is the distal root with DB1 and DB2 on the other side. This is distal side, and this is the mesial side. And at the bottom, you see the palatal. 3 plus 2 plus 1, 6 canal case. How do I diagnose this? I diagnose it with the x-ray. I don't need anything more because the tooth looks so large. And then what I do is, OK, in this case, we took a CBCT mainly to prove that there are, in the end, it's a seven canal case because if you look at here, mesial root is three roots, distal root has got two, and palatal at the apical splits into two. I mainly took a CBCT to find out about the palatal root I normally don't take, and then I obturate such a case. Seven canals, and if you missed one or two of them, there's no prizes for guessing. This case will keep repeatedly coming back with postoperative pain. So one of the tricks in endo is to be able to anticipate extra canals. The, the next law of endo, which is so important, is don't lose the glide path. Get the patency up to working length. If you lose the patency, if you don't get up to the working length, you are finished. There's no point having a microscope, no point having all gadgets if you don't know how to reach up to the working length. So and if you ask me, when I speak to, I, I conduct courses, you know that here I, I come and I am with Pratum Mukut and all others and so many other uh, practitioners here with whom we have done courses. When we teach students how to do endo, one of the first things I teach them is this. Uh, when I ask them which is the biggest error an operator can do, what is the big, worst error in endo? What is the worst error you can do in endo? And most of them would answer me by saying it is either a perforation or it's a broken instrument. They'll say these are the bad errors in endo. But if you ask me, neither of them are as bad as you doing the worst error in endo, which causes the maximum amount of failures, the error which causes the maximum amount of postoperative pain and complications is when you lose the working length or create a ledge. So if there's something you need to be worried about in shaping process, to me, is always in trying to do, making sure that you are getting the working length right to get the patency right. And to get the patency using the right instruments as the first instruments being either a size 10 or a size 8 pre-curved file used in a reaming motion is probably the best way to do and not using larger size instruments or rotary instruments immediately. So you need to realize that patency is probably one of the most important aspects of shaping when we go ahead. But if you ask me what would gain me success to make sure my patients are happy, no post-operative pain, then I have to remember this rule, that cleaning is more important than shaping. When I was a student, we were all emphasized on more on shaping. You have to do till 20 size, 30 size, 35 size. It's all about files, each company's files. We all have these things coming happening again and again. So for us, it all the time it used to be how, what number of file we were using. That's what we was important. But if you ask me now in endo, if you want to do it very well, painlessly, think about between shaping and cleaning, the emphasis should be us always been more on shaping and less on cleaning. But it should be the reverse. You should be worried more about how well you clean the canals so that the pulp is removed, so that there's no remnant tissue for pain to happen. So for that, you have to remember this slide. If you ask me, what causes the maximum amount of failures in endo? It's a combination of two things. People don't find canals, and they, when they find a canal, they don't know how to shape and clean it. This is the two reasons why endo fails. You miss canals, and you don't know how to shape and clean. And when we find canals, we find canals something like this. This is how your mesial, your molar looks like, pulp tissue on an x-ray. How does it look? It looks something like this. But actual truth is, when the molar you see cross-section of a mesial canal, the mesial canal is a crazy. It's like your Brahmaputra river. It's wide, but it's got its own tree, trees, fins, deltas. It's a crazy place inside a root canal. It is not as simple as it looks in the GP. So when we see root canals in x-rays, 
it's totally different from what actually happens inside. It's totally a different ball game. So when I have root canals and when we use rotary, so the next question people ask me is which company to buy, which rotary files to buy. To be very frank, I always tell that more important than the file is to always ask the question, who is the monkey holding the file? <laughs> Do you understand what I'm trying to say? So it's not about the file. Who is the operator here? So if you give an operator who's experienced, the file actually doesn't matter. There are many files which will have some advantages, no doubt about that, but in the end of the day, it is about the operator. Because when you use a rotary file inside a root canal, you are just creating paths. But you do not clean the canal completely. And that's why patients have pain. Remnant pulp tissues have more pain. So when you are practicing in the northeast of India, I'm sorry to tell you, but you have the toughest root canals on earth, the patients you treat. The mongoloid population has the most toughest root canals. I'm not joking. They are the most complex. So if you see a root canal, this is an access opening. Do you see? To me, it looks like a smiley. Does it look like a smiley to you? To me, it looks like a smiley, a smile. But if a root canal smiles at you, it's bad news. It's a real bad news. Why? Because this is, when you use a rotary instrument in this, it's not going to help. Because this is a canal which is C-shaped, which will have an extension like that and an another extension like that. So how do I clean this canal with my rotary files? It's impossible. So you people here have a very tough, challenging job because your patients who come to you have more of C-shaped canals. So if your preoperative x-rays have these fused conical roots, that's the case in which you'll have more amount of C-shaped canals and the ability to do predictably is less. So you need to focus more on cleaning than on shaping. So when you look at distal roots like this, where the, the canal is like an oval canal, this is a tougher root canal than a mesial root. So people feel that why do I, my post-operative pain happens, you leave pulp tissue in these areas, it's inflamed, bacteria is left behind, they again repopulate and again will cause pain. And that's why failures occur. So that's the, that's the trick for you to understand that these cases are the toughest cases in endo when you want to do predictably. So what is the solution? The solution is very simple. The solution is you need to irrigate it more than shaping. More than spending your time on rotary instruments, you need to spend a little more time on the amount of time you spend on your irrigation is what you need to see. So the key for endo, if you want to, while doing endo, to make sure you get success, remove the pulp, no pain post-operatively, then it depends on what irrigant are you using. The, the, the person who has done probably the most amount of work on irrigation is a man called Zender. And he's from Switzerland, from the University of Zurich. He's an amazing speaker on irrigation. He never likes to travel. But uh, we have convinced him to come to India next year for the World Congress. So next September, if you want to listen to a lecture on irrigation by, we call him King of Irrigation. It's a man called Matt Zender. Uh, he's also going to come. He, if you listen to him, you'll understand how to irrigate well. And I have learned from him. And what we realize is only one thing. We don't have anything other than hypochlorite. So if you use anything else, I use saline, I use other aspects of irrigation, it really just doesn't help. You need to use hypochlorite. So when I talk to general dentists, I tell them, we recommend using a rubber dam, not because an instrument is going down the throat, but we recommend using a rubber dam because if you don't use a rubber dam and use hypochlorite, the patient will spit on your face. Because the hypochlorite is such a lousy smelling liquid. You just can't use it without a dam. So that's why if you look at endodontists, we like using a rubber dam because we use hypochlorite. So if you want to take one more tip from me, is to go and try doing your molars under rubber dam and using hypochlorite, you will see your patients, the post-op is much, much more eventless because you remove pulp tissues and bacteria very predictably. So when we work, if you look at this, this is just a case of an anterior I took under the scope, mainly to show you, you can see the effervescence of the hypochlorite inside the canal. You can see it bubbling inside, because that's the way it will go and clean all the bacteria out. 
So when people ask me, okay, this is the way you use your hypo, how do you, what do you use there? You want to clean, this is exactly what is what we need to do inside a root canal. It's a hilly, dirty place like this rocky mountain through which a river is flowing. And if you want the river to clean this, you need to give the river two things. You need to give it time and you need to give it concentration. If you don't have time and concentration, you can't clean well. So if there's something I picked up from this image is that if you want to use your endo well, give hypochlorite time. That means you need to irrigate more amount of time and give it more concentration. So using 1% hypochlorite is useless. Most of us give our students 1% saying it's safe. 1% hypochlorite is like saline. It just doesn't help. So you need to use 5% if not 3% hypochlorite is what you do. So if you ask me, uh, let's skip this part of it. If you ask me, we feel that when we irrigate inside a root canal by placing a needle, it's like a tsunami which goes and kills all bacteria and comes out and then I can obturate and I'll get success. But the truth is when you irrigate inside the patient's mouth, the body's pressure is pushing back the liquid. So the liquid doesn't go to the apical third. So if you want one more clinical tip from me to go back and do better endo, this is something I'm very passionate, is you need to have stoppers on your irrigating needles. Why you need to have that? Because we know that the best place to place a needle and get good irrigation to kill bacteria and remove pulp tissue is if you're able to place the needle three mm short of the working length. So where should you place your irrigating needle is three millimeters short of the working length. So what we recommend is wherever your, your, your apex is, you will measure and keep your needle 3 mm short. So I normally like to have a stopper on my irrigating needle. So whenever I have my working length as 20 mm, I know 17 mm is the stopper, so I know I've reached 3 mm short of the working length. And that's how we, I like to irrigate. If you, want, if you don't trust me, go back tomorrow to your clinic and try putting a stopper and seeing how deep it goes. And most of you, if you're using uh, 27 gauge and 30 gauge, uh, 26 gauge needles, it won't go deep inside a molar. And that's why molars have always more post-operative pain. So you need to take the needle 3 mm short using a 30 gauge needle. And that's what we do. So if you look at this, you need to give it concentration, you need to give it time, you need to use the right needle, go deep inside, and then use the hypo because the hypo is our best friend in endodontics. The, the last rule which I will discuss is you, when you do endo, you should also be smart enough to know when not to do endo. More than knowing when to do, a smart person is the one who will know when not to do. So I'd like to end this presentation on uh, pain management endo by telling you two cases which are commonly misdiagnosed and people keep doing endo in them. And then the patient keeps coming back and saying, you did work, but it's still paining. So what are the two things which we normally, you need to avoid? Look at this case. This is a case in which I did the uh, second molar endo. Endo is done, but patient is still symptomatic. Patient keeps coming back and saying, what you have done, it's still paining. It's still paining, that region is paining. <laughs> when I look at this x-ray, we try to see there was nothing going wrong in the seven we, which I've worked. But, but the patient is showing the seven, not showing anywhere else. If you look at the six, this molar, is there anything wrong in this molar? If you actually look at it, nothing is wrong in this molar. There's just one small amalgam uh, filling on top of it, nothing else. But this is a classic case where the patient's history gives you the diagnosis. The patient says, when I bite, I can't eat nowadays. Whenever I chew that side, I have pain. Obviously, we know periapical lesions will cause periapical periodontitis, would cause pain on occlusion. But this is a case in which there is nothing seen on the x-rays. Patient has got no caries in the mouth. Why is they having pain in the region? This is a case of a cracked tooth. So if you want to diagnose a cracked tooth, you need little magnification. Because then only if you see in the slide here, can you see the line extending into the pulp chamber? As the cracked tooth progresses, initially the cracked tooth will not give you any radiographic diagnosis. So many people do endo in these cases and give a crown. And after the crown is given, the patient keeps loading and the crown starts to fracture deep inside. Again, the patient comes back with pain. Your endo is hopelessly failed within a month or so. 
So if you need to diagnose that, make sure two points in cracked tooth. It's always done in, always seen in molars, more than premolars, it's seen in molars. It will be always be seen on this mesial and distal marginal ridge. So where do you focus to see whether there is a crack? Not all over the tooth. Only on the mesial and distal marginal ridge is where the crack starts to propagate. So that's how you diagnose a cracked tooth syndrome. This is the crack. The other tooth which you don't touch in endo is a vertical root fracture case, BRF case. And how do you diagnose that case? Because these also patients come to you with pain. And I, as a root canal specialist, get retreatment cases, which are referred to as, they will send us cases for retreatment. And this, again, a premolar, which has come to me for retreatment. I take multiple angulated x-rays. And what do I see in these multiple angulated x-ray is that in one x-ray, you will see that the GP is going out by one millimeter in one of the roots. What we have understood about rotary endo is this. If you over obturate your cases beyond the apex, in the long run, these cases have a higher tendency to go for our vertical root fractures. So we don't want you to be short of the apex, but at the same time, don't be over obturating. So people who don't use apex locators, don't use right techniques and over instrument, two things happen. You have more post-operative pain, and you also have a tendency to have vertical root fractures, which are very painful. This is a case which is hopeless to do re-root canal. Because we extracted this case, and when we extracted this case, you would see this, that on extraction, you would see this here. That is the vertical root fracture on the buccal wall. Very, very common to see that. So people keep asking, how do I get to do uh, endo well? And how do I go about doing uh, post-endo work in which your sealer, which goes outside, outside your root canal, is acceptable. Your sealer, but not your GP point. Earlier, when I was a student, I was taught that the GP is more friendly, the sealer is an irritant. But now the philosophy is completely reversed. The GP is inert, but if it goes beyond the apex because of its taper and because of me using the rotary, we will cause more problems in them. So if you ask me, is there a way in which I can tell you how to do good endo as a regime, these are the points I would say. Do a conservative access opening. Don't make it too big. Make a conservative access opening. Try to get canal patency to working length. That's the key. Don't make, lose the working length because then you lose the case. Get the canal patency to working length, and I will always believe in little orifice enlargement. Why this helps the liquid irrigation to go deeper? That's the second point. We like to enlarge the canal to three sizes larger than the initial first binding file. 30 size is a preferable size for master cone sizes, not 20 and 25. 35, 30 is a better size than 20 and 25. You use a 25 or a 20 when the tapers are bigger. So if you use an 8% instrument, you can use a 25. But if you use a 6% instrument, using 30 size is better. Using hypochloride is the most ideal irrigation solution which you will have. Try to activate your hypo with your GP point. You can use it with your manual dynamic activation. So if you get a C-shaped case, you can pump the root canal with your MDA. Try to finish your root canal with 17% EDTA liquid. 1 ml for 1 minute. So when you place 17 ml for 1 minute, it stays inside and, and slightly makes the whole area better. And then you can obturate the way you want. I would, I would like to end this presentation by showing you one case which gives you the complete essence of endo. A case in which it's a retreatment case where you see patient has a repeated pain incidences after endo and comes back to you. When a patient repeatedly says there is pain after endo, it can mean only two things, I told you. It can mean either the previous dentist left some root canals or they have not cleaned it enough. So this is a case in which when I open up, now you see what, what do I get. This is a case in which you get on one side MB123, this side again DB123 and a palatal canal. This is, looks like a seven canal case, but it's a six canal case here, wherein you you realize that these irregularly shaped canals have a lot of pulp tissue which is causing the infection and the pain. So you simply do the, do the shaping cleaning using hypochlorite, placing intracanal calcium hydroxide, and then you obturate this case, and then you get good healing at the end of it. So endodontics is basically not about just finding canals. So I can show you case after case like this where I can show you x-rays which look good. 
Endodontic perfection is on one side, but along with endodontic perfection, what you need to do is to understand that you need to do this process painlessly. That's the key. And to do painlessly, you need to understand you need to respect the periapical area. And to respect the periapical area from the right, from the first step, you don't try to go outside. So using the reason why we insist on apex locator nowadays is that, why we insist on having good quality radiographs, why we insist on good isolation, why we insist on using hypochlorite, every step has a reason. So when people ask me how to do painless endodontics, it's like asking me how to make your mother's favorite dish. Is there one step in it or many steps in it? It involves many steps to cook a fantastic dish. So if you do all these small points properly, at the complete end of the process is what you have is a beautiful root canal. So now what I feel is root canal is not about putting GP points inside. Earlier days, I used to be a flip card or an Amazon delivery boy, putting GP inside the patient's root canals. But now I feel you should look at it differently. It's the experience of the patient. If you want a successful practice, Today I am here in Guwahati, it's a Saturday, it's a peak running day of my practice. My patients are getting treated by my team, but endo will be done by me. But the patients are trusting my rest of the team because the endo is done by me. So the crowns will happen, the surgeries or implants, whatever other specialties will be able to do. So whenever somebody asks me how to have a good successful practice, I'll say learn to do endo well and learn to do endo painlessly. Once you do the endo process well, the rest of the process of prosto and the rest of thing falls into place by itself. If you want to learn endo even better, then you need to come to probably Chennai next year. Because uh, as I told you, it's been my dream to bring the best speakers and best clinicians uh, in India and uh, all over the world to, to India. So what I've done is... September of next year, 23 to 26th of September, and probably 40 of the top speakers and uh, clinicians and academicians uh, in the world will be coming for this uh, conference. Uh, the registrations will be open from next year, and for the first time, our specialty is opening the doors for other specialties. So you want to listen to Malamed, you want to listen to, have you heard of uh, Anderson's classification of traumatic injury? Anderson is coming to India for the first time for this lecture. Malamed is going to come and talk on pain management in endo. Dr. Singh Yuk Kim is the king of endo surgery. He will perform a live surgery. Uh, Zender, whom I talked about irrigation, he's going to come. You must be seeing in Facebook people like Hamo, Sergio Nicola, Anthony's. These are all very famous clinicians around the world. Like this, 40 speakers in four days. I think it's a once in a lifetime opportunity to, if you really enjoy endo, to be in an endo congress in your own country. Because the next time it comes to India, it's after 50 to 60 years. I definitely will not be practicing at that time. I don't know about you people, but it's a lovely opportunity. The complete endo fraternity, including Buyan sir from here, all of us together have brought this to India. So it's a national event which will be conducted at Chennai. I will look forward to have all of you. So if you ever come to Chennai next year, I will be your host. Thank you once again for this wonderful opportunity to be here and share my thoughts on how to do painless endo. Thank you one, one and all for this opportunity. Thank you.